1990, Mary Cartledge Hayes wrote profoundly about the experience of coming to love Delilah, describing the process of undoing her judgmental attitude towards this woman, which she attributed to cultural inheritance. She came to realize that Delilah, like other biblical characters, was human and capable of both good and bad. Reading the Hebrew text alongside Carthage Hayes left me with a resounding question. Why did I grow up thinking that Delilah was a prostitute and Samson a hero? This paper comes from a conviction that the women of the Bible have for too long been portrayed in two dimensions as either holy virgins or hell-bound harlots. When I read the Bible, I see three-dimensional complex women, women who sin and are righteous, just like their male counterparts. However, this is not how the women of Judges 13 to 16 have been received in commentaries or in culture. And much of this has to do with language, with translation choices. My paper will focus on the issue of vocabulary choice in the target language, looking at the three women in Judges 14 to 16. Samson's Timnite wife, the prostitute he visits in Gaza, and Delilah. We will see how vocabulary choices, loaded with implied cultural meaning, impact reader reception and interpretation of the text. When we talk about quality in Bible translation, we must think about the interpretative choices that are being made by translators and how these impact of the theological conclusions drawn by readers and hearers of the text. Translating these women well matters. Misrepresentations of female biblical characters have driven women from the church and been used to perpetuate abusive ideologies. The more faith we faithfully we translate the women of the Bible in the way that the Bible represents them, the closer we are able to come to dismantling harmful teaching and to understanding God's heart for women. My methodology and hermeneutic is informed by feminist theological practices. I will use a hermeneutic of retrieval that approaches interpretations with suspicion, but the Bible with trust. I stand in the line of those feminists who remain in the church and regard the Bible as scripture. Lawrence Venuti's translation theory serves as a frame for the analysis that follows. Venuti suggests that translations fall broadly into two categories, foreignizing and domesticating. Foreignizing translations allow the text to remain foreign translated in such a way as to indicate to the reader that this text is at home in a different time, place and culture from their own. Domesticating translations, on the other hand, seek to bring the text into line with the reception culture, giving the reader easier access to the concepts contained within it. All translation includes some necessary degree of compromise, and translators must choose between these options. However, concepts with gender-specific meanings are more likely to be domesticated, which can lead to a systematic distortion of concepts related to women in the text. In Judges 14 to 16, this applies to gender-weighted concepts such as nagging and to the cultural assumptions that load the word prostitute and its various synonyms. Bollinger has described language as a loaded weapon. Words carry cultural weight as each of us read in light of our existing prototypes and schemata. As an example, if I say a simple sentence, the sun dipped below the horizon, I wonder what scene you have conjured in your head. That scene will depend on your own cognitive schemata for each of the words contained in the sentence. Does the word horizon lead you to picture mountains, the sea, plains, or maybe the high-rise skyline of a city? Your experience might have you imagining a beautiful sunset or feeling unsettled at what the darkness might bring. So much variety for one sentence. 
if this is true of a sim of simple concepts, what about words which are loaded with cultural meaning and implication? Words like whore and nag. The three women in chapters 14 to 16 of Judges have often been conflated. The flow of the cycle draws the attention of the reader to the similarities between the Timnite and Delilah, with the stories clearly mirroring one another. However, reception history has often read the Timnite in light of Delilah rather than Delilah in light of the Timnite. Because Delilah is complicit in Samson's mistreatment, the Timnite is accused of the same. Three Hebrew words referring to the Timnite have been historically translated in particularly loaded ways and differently from elsewhere in the Hebrew Bible. The first is the word Yesha, which carries the meaning to be straight, level or right. In Judges 16, 17, 6 and 21, 25, this word comes again with the sentence, everyone did what was right in their own eyes. The repeated use of this phrase can be seen as tracking the moral degeneration of Israel through the book. Like his nation, Samson makes increasingly poor choices, which progressively take him further from obedience to the Lord. With this context in mind, the use of Yesha in 14.3 and 14.7 suggests that Samson is making a moral judgment about what he thinks is right for him, disregarding cultural and religious norms and his parents. This alongside 14.7, where Samson speaks to the woman and her rightness in his eyes is confirmed, suggests that there's more to this statement than beauty or physical attraction. However, many commentators have seen 14.3 and 14.7 as a special case which needs to be translated differently from 17.6 or 21.25. They argue that because 14.3 is about a woman, Yesha must refer exclusively to physical beauty or sexual desire without moral implications. This is in part due to the Septuagint and Vulgate, both which translate pleasing, pleases my eyes and both of which have different words for Yesha in 17.6 and 21.25. They're using words that have explicit moral implications. The translation of this phrase seems to be a clear example of gender bias in interpretation, with no reason for an exceptional translation in this instance, other than the word being used in reference to a woman. The next significant word in the translation of this woman is patar in 1415, to persuade or convince. The majority of English translations choose the less conceptually loaded words persuade or coax, whilst Nidditch uses seduce, claiming that the woman pries open her man psychologically and sexually. Patar does suggest something closer to seduction in Exodus 22.16. However, in the context of this narrative, it is hard to imagine how seven days of weeping could be construed as seduction. As with Yesha, it seems that Patar is rendered seduced because it fits with the common interpretation of this story, which sees the Timnite woman as the culprit and Samson as the victim. The final noteworthy translation choice for the Timnite is of Souk in 1417, to harass, to press hard, to drive someone into a corner. Like Patar, here and in 16, these are the only examples of the Hebrew Bible of this action being attributed to a woman. The word has military associations and expresses severe physical and psychological hardship or distress. It's used when Jerusalem is under siege and with reference to the day of the Lord. This is clearly a powerful word, implying that the Timnite and Delilah both put Samson under extreme pressure. But the NRSV chooses to translate this word nagged. And many commentators, though they avoid the word nagged in their translations, go on to use it in their commentaries. Even Ackerman accuses both women of nagging Samson. 
Bellis reserves Nag for Delilah and uses the less derogatory Beg for the Tim Knight. But Beg still seems to fall quite far outside the scope of the Hebrew word Suk. It is only possible to justify translating Suk as Nag by ignoring the woman's circumstances, ignoring canonical use of the Hebrew word and prioritising cultural assumptions and reception of the narrative over the text. The Timnite acted under threat of death. She was then abandoned by Samson and eventually burnt to death with her family, despite meeting the men's request. By choosing Nag, translators are belittling the woman, reducing the extremity of the situation for Samson and underplaying the Timnite's desperation. In many English speaking cultures, the word Nag is incredibly loaded. It is rarely, if ever, used as a man and it carries a conceptual framework of oppressive stereotypes about women. Here is a clear example of a domesticating choice which changes the shape and focus of the narrative. Removing these loaded concepts from the way the text is understood would paint a very different picture of the Timnite and would allow the horrific treatment of the woman to come to the fore. Our second female character, the Gazan, warrants only five words of Hebrew text. However, there is still a significant point to make about translation choices within these five words, and that is the choice of how to translate zonah. Whilst the cow participle is said to unequivocally refer to prostitution, especially when preceded by isha, because of the range of available synonyms in English, this is a loaded translation choice. This selection of translations shows the phrase Isha Zona being rendered for women, harlot, prostitute, and a woman who was a prostitute. Though at a technical level these words carry the same meaning, the conceptual framework and cultural loading is radically different. The Oxford English Dictionary lists both whore and harlot as chiefly derogatory offensive and terms of abuse. These are word choices replete with extra layers of meaning. Using these words in the reception language shifts responsibility onto the woman, whilst the word prostitute leaves her as the passive character, which she is in the text. The Hebrew Bible is not universal in its attitude towards women who find themselves in prostitution. Two in particular stand out as being written sympathetically. Tamar in Genesis 38, who is called righteous, and Rahab in Joshua 6, who is given a lasting place amongst God's people. In the New Testament, Jesus repeatedly extends compassion to women accused of sexual immorality, including prostitution. The compassion toward prostitutes from the Hebrew Bible is confirmed in the epistles, particularly in Hebrews and James. Because the text here provides no details about this woman, we cannot know how she came to find herself in prostitution. Choosing to translate Isha Zona, whore or harlot, rather than the more neutral prostitute, is a choice to make assumptions about this woman, which prejudice the reader against her and perpetuate the idea that the Bible, and by implication God, is patriarchal and anti-woman. Choosing to translate Isha Zona as prostitute paints a more culturally and linguistically neutral canvas, leaving interpretation options open. Even better is the choice Women of Prostitution, a literal translation which separates the woman from the prostitution, allowing prostitution to become a characteristic rather than her entire character. Much more has been written about Delilah than any of her female companions. Her translation and interpretation issues align with those of the Timnite, largely due to the textual similarities. Both women are asked by Philistine men to patar Samson, both are said to suit him, and both speak of the falsity of his love. However, there are fundamental differences between these women, which the text is designed to highlight. Where the Timnite is threatened, Delilah is bribed. Where the Timnite is desperate, Delilah appears strong. Textual issues concerning the Gazan also impact Delilah. 
This is apparent through the number of times Delilah is described by commentators as a prostitute, despite the text never naming her as such. In popular culture and in reception history, Delilah is seen as a dangerous and seductive woman who lures her lover into a trap. Commentators and translators have supported these presumptions, calling Delilah ruthless, evil, seductive, unfaithful, treasonous and traitorous. However, very little of this can be found in the Hebrew text, and this popular perception of the woman relies on ignoring key elements of the narrative. Two of the Hebrew words we have already discussed occur again here. The first is patar for which various translators choose to use a different English word than they did for the Timnite. Butler changes from persuade to entice, and the ESV changes from entice to seduce. We've already discussed the implications of the choice of seduce here, and using a different word in 1614 than in 145 seems to be grounded not in the text, but in cultural assumptions about Delilah. By naming Delilah a seductress, a level of premeditated intentionality is added. However, 16.4 makes it clear that responsibility for the relationship lay with Samson, stating that he saw her and he loved her. Translating Qatar as seduce can be seen as a domesticating choice, playing into a cultural type of the seductive woman and lending to support to existing perceptions of Delilah which are not derived from the text. With regards to Souk, Butler changes his word from pressured to harassed, and the NIV changes from pressed to nagged. Again, this change to a gender derogatory concept of nag or nagged does not seem to be justified by the text, but does play into cultural assumptions about Delilah. It is much easier to claim, as commentators often do, that Delilah deceived or betrayed Samson if Patar has been translated as seduce and Seek as nag. As with the Timnite, many of these interpretations are based not on the text, but on cultural presupposition and reception history. Rubens painting of which this is, um, this is a copy gives us a glimpse into a different understanding of Delilah's character. The Philistine soldiers lurk in the doorway, bringing the pressure that Delilah was under starkly to mind. The look on Delilah's face suggests neither a mercenary nor a sadistic seductress, but rather a desperate woman with no way out. After all, it was the Philistine lords who had come to her. In the end, Delilah is morally ambiguous. Though the text does not call her a prostitute, a nag, or a seductress, she does accept payment for tormenting Samson. Perhaps the wisest path is to follow the lead of scripture and allow Delilah to sit in our minds as a nuanced character, neither hero nor villain, but in her full humanity, capable of both good and bad. This is not a call to see Delilah as a hero, but to make translation choices that do not perpetuate unfounded cultural assumptions. This is just a fraction of what could be said about the women of the Samson cycle and the translation choices within their stories. But if this is scripture, where does God come into it? The story of Samson is theologically confusing for the modern reader. The extent of Samson's interactions with God seems to be the spirit of the Lord rushing on him to empower him to commit violent acts. God appears absent in Samson's actions towards women, other than in 14.4, when the narrator tells the reader that God has prompted Samson's choice of wife. This prompting of his choice is not, however, the same as a divine condoning of Samson's subsequent actions towards the Timnite and the other women. A canonical reading is essential to understanding this. Set in its biblical context, the reader knows that Samson has transgressed his Nazarite restrictions in eating honey from the carcass of the lion. Without this action, he could not have set the riddle. Without the riddle, the Timnite's life would not have been at risk. 
the reader knows that God was seeking a pretext to act against the Philistines. But 14.9 tells us that it was Samson's disobedience that led to events in Timnah. Why does this matter? Perhaps it has been easier over the centuries for translators and commentators to condemn these women rather than to risk the implication that God was complicit in their ill treatment. In making this choice, they have perpetuated harmful teachings that present biblical women as stereotypes and suggest that scripture and by association God is unkind towards women. The book of Judges does not need to be reduced in this way. It is possible for God to have prompted Samson to choose the Timnite woman and at the same time for Samson's disobedience to have led to the subsequent devastation in line with the pattern of moral degeneration throughout the book of Judges. By failing to account for the overall sweep of the narrative, commentators have not noted how these women all contribute to Samson's eventual heroics. Rather than being incidental plot devices, it is these women who carry Samson's story and make possible the beginning of deliverance from the Philistines that he is to bring. By translating these women without relying on loaded language that prejudices the reader against them, we can rebalance our reading of the story so that their vital roles are seen. Our assumptions about women in the text contribute to harmful narratives about women in the church. Therefore, how we treat the text has a real impact on how we treat women, both within and beyond our worshipping communities today. It also has real implications for what women believe about the God of the Bible. Quality in Bible translation includes awareness of cultural loading of words and the way in which one synonym, chosen over another, has the potential to create a harlot or a heroine where the text has a woman.